So I'm assuming you're here because you've either just brought the Mavic 3 Pro and wondering where to start, you're waiting for it to arrive and want to be prepared for your first flight, or you're just a curious nerd like me who loves new tech and wants to know what's new and different in the functions on this drone. A sign from the triple camera system, of course. So in this video, we're looking under the hood and going through the menu systems in this drone to give you some tips and tricks that you might not be aware of. Now, just before we begin, make sure that you've updated your firmware on this drone. Otherwise, you might not be able to access the newest features like D-Log M. Now, with that out of the way, let's dive in. Firstly, let's talk about the controller itself. Now, it doesn't matter if you've got the DJI RC controller or the DJI RC Pro. In terms of app functionality, there's really nothing being restricted on the regular DJI RC controller that you're not getting in the RC Pro. They both have the same video and photo bumper buttons at the top, dials to adjust gimbal tilt and zoom functionalities, a flight pause button and quick flight performance buttons in the middle. But what you do get in the RC Pro is processing power, and that can give you better overall performance and extra responsiveness when accessing the menu systems. It's also a slightly extended battery life, a brighter screen performance for sunny days, 32 gigabytes of internal storage. But for us, we love the inclusion of a mini HDMI output for external monitors or attaching the DJI Raven Eye for an additional monitor without the use of long HDMI cables. We've got a video about that if you're interested. But again, in terms of actual drone functionality and the app functionality, you will have access to all the same smart features regardless of the controller that you have. On to the menu system. So if you've flown the Air 2S, Mini 3 Pro or Mavic 3, you'll be familiar with the Fly app and the Mavic 3 Pro functions pretty much the same with the three dots on the top right bringing up the main menu systems for safety, drone control, camera settings, transmission and additional information about the drone, which is also where you can find the latest firmware update. On the bottom left is your drone's positional data. This is where connecting to your phone Wi-Fi might be beneficial because it will have real-time map updates. It will also show elevation as well as distance from your home point. Bottom right, we've got the quick access camera settings with the left side giving you access to things like color balance, resolution and color profiles, with the right side giving you access to settings to manage your exposure in flight like ISO, shutter, aperture, as well as the multimeter to see where your exposure levels are at. Just next to that, you can toggle your auto or manual exposure settings. Middle right is the record or shutter button for either video or photos. Above that is where you can toggle between photo and video, as well as access some key functions, which we'll get into shortly. And below the record button is where you can review all the photos and videos you've taken. But the newest and most exciting is these three options here, which represent the new triple camera system this drone has, which is the one times 24 millimeter wide, the three times 70 millimeter medium tally, and the seven times 166 millimeter tally camera. Being able to switch between focal links without needing to land is this drone's key strength. And it's as simple as pressing one of these three buttons to switch. However, just know that when you're switching, it is an entirely different camera system with different sensors. So the drone system does need some time to process this. So it is not instantaneous. It, it can take around maybe two seconds to change over, regardless of which controller you have. Also, each camera does perform slightly differently with limitations to resolution, bitrate, and color profiles. We'll be doing another video deep diving into these limitations, specifically focusing on color profiles, so look out for that one. But very top level, the 24 mm and 70 mm share the color profiles of normal, hybrid log gamma, and the new D-Log M, which is a flat profile like D-Log, not as flat, and it has no base ISO, so it makes it much easier to grade in post-production, while still giving some really nice dynamic range in both the high and low lights. This means that you have three color profiles to share on both cameras, so it will give you some extra creative abilities and flexibility in the air, but also in post-production. So which one you'll use is up to you, but one thing to know is that on the base drone model, only the D-Log M and a hybrid Log Gabba profiles support 10-bit color, with the normal profile only being 8-bit. So you'll be able to push the grades further in those two color profiles. Hybrid Log Gamma gives you much more vivid baked in colors straight out of the camera. So if you're not too into grading, it's usually a more visually exciting profile to shoot rather than the normal. Plus you'll also get the advantage of 10-bit color. If you are wanting to shoot in a flatter log profile, however, you can also use the color display assist button, which will give you a rough idea of what your color corrected footage may look like in post. However, this is just a guide and does not bake into the footage. It's just visual to help with the exposure. 
We've got a link in the description to D-Log M and D-Log Conversion LUTs to make sure you grab that to assist in bringing the footage up to the standard Rec. 709 color space if you are serious about color grading. We also have a link to our own LUTs that we created, so feel free to give those a go. Creating custom folders and file names might not be hugely interesting to the majority of you. However, if you have a day with multiple jobs, it can make wrangling at the end of the day much easier. To access this, go to the three dots at the top right, then under camera, scroll down to under the storage selection and you'll find the options there. Once you do use this renaming functionality, each folder or file will then be updated so you can use this for specific clients or even specific jobs. It's also handy in case you're in the habit of renaming these afterwards instead of the usual DJI underscore number configuration that it's always been. Adjusting flight performance is not a brand new feature, but it's important to make you aware these settings exist as they're super important in customizing your drones in each of the flight profiles of Cine, Normal and Sports Mode. These settings are found under control in the main settings in gain and expo tuning. Here you can tweak everything from the drone's max speed to how much input you need to push the sticks for the drone to respond using the expo settings, which can be handy in cine mode, as well as smoothness of the gimbal tilt or how much it might travel once you've stopped moving the dial. This can be super helpful when easing in and out of flight movements. The factory settings are pretty much fine for normal and sports mode, however we recommend playing around with the cine mode to really customise your flying style to get the most cinematic shots out of this drone, especially when shooting with the 3x and 7x as when the composition is more compressed, small movements will become much more noticeable, so the smoother movements the better. If you feel like you've done a little bit too much tweaking, you can always reset this with the button at the bottom of the settings. Now onto some smart features that we love on this drone. The hyperlapse capabilities of the Mavic series has always been standout, but now you can shoot 70mm hyperlapses, so we recommend playing around with this to get some really nice cinematic compressed hyperlapse sequences we've never been able to do in a drone this size before. The waypoint functionality has been around for a while now, but whatever positioning power is behind this seems to be producing more accurate replications of shots than the previous Mavic 3 in our testing, even without any RTK compatibility. This is a great feature to show changes in scenes over time, like construction progress, or what a scene looks like in changing light conditions, especially paired with the night mode feature. Now this feature does have its limitations in regards to color profile with only normal available, which means it's only 8-bit color, it has a max of 4K resolution and a frame rate of 25 or 30 frames. However, when coupled with Waypoint, you can create some great visual transitions that take minimal post-production aligning to match. Even with the base ISO of 800, we can see very minimal noise in the image, which is amazing. Active Track 5.0 is of course included. To access this, it's as simple as touching the screen and dragging your finger over a subject, and the AI will then determine what it might be looking at and adjust its tracking parameters to suit, whether it's a person, car, or boat. Now we've found in testing that Spotlight is a bit more reliable in terms of tracking consistency than Active Track, and it also gives you the freedom to move the drone's distance and altitude freely to now more complex shots, especially when your subject isn't moving too much in the frame. Lastly, these are some key features we recommend setting up before you've even launched, both for safety, but also to make shooting in the air as an enjoyable experience as possible and to get the results that you want. Firstly, safety. Look, you've paid a lot for this drone and you want to make sure it comes back, so we highly recommend setting a return to home height at a minimum higher than the highest structure closest to you. That's generally anywhere between 60 to 100 meters. Also, even in the event of a loss of signal or disconnection from the controller, it's important to have the drone set to return to home instead of land or hover. Now, it should be set to this as default, but double check this in the advanced safety settings found at the bottom of the safety menu. The other thing you'll find here is the emergency propeller stop setting. We only recommend this, of course, in an emergency, but it's good to know that in the event of a flyaway and it might be heading towards someone that might cause an injury, this will allow you to cut the propellers instantaneously. Don't worry, you actually need to go into the settings and click on the emergency only button in order to unlock this ability so it won't happen in regular flight but again just so you're aware that it's there if the unimaginable happens. Button customization is one thing that a lot of people overlook but it can greatly improve the usability when on a shoot. Now you have two buttons under the controller and by default the C1 button pressed will cause the gimbal to look straight down. This is great for repositioning the gimbal quickly if needed however 
This also has a secondary function. If you hold down C1 and then move the right bumper, this can adjust the shutter to help quickly adjust exposure instead of needing to take a hand off the controller and go into the settings manually. Then holding the C2 button with the right bumper will adjust the ISO. However, both the main and the secondary functionalities can be adjusted depending on what you might find most useful when flying. So feel free to go into the settings and see what might work best for you. Now you might be wondering why is there a subtitle option in the camera settings? Well, this file, which comes in the form of an SRT file, gives you the specifications of the footage that you've captured. And this includes pretty much everything from ISO, shutter, the camera, exposure, color profile, aperture, and even the longitude and latitude of the drone. Now, this might be useful if you're delivering files to a client and it's handy to let them know any additional specifications that the editor might need to know that aren't readily available in the metadata when importing into editing software, which is usually just the resolution and the frame rate that it was recorded at. Now, if you don't think you'll need this, just turn this off as it'll save you having to deal with unnecessary files when wrangling. Exposure is key when trying to get the perfect shot and it's forever changing depending on where the sun is and which way the drone is facing. So by turning the histogram on, you have a good idea where your exposure levels are at. The very left being the shadows and the very right the highlights. So as long as you don't see any super high peaks at either end, your exposure should be okay. By turning on the overexposure warning, it's giving you a hint that even though the scene might be appearing to be well balanced, there are elements that may be clipping in the highlights. This is handy, especially on cloudy days, where it might be difficult to judge the overall exposure levels. The crosshatch and grid lines are super handy to turn on as it's a quick reference for not only the rule of thirds when doing your compositions, finding the center of your frame if you're looking to orbit a point of interest, but also when you're doing manual panoramas as it can let you know how much overlap you might need. So there you have it guys. We hope that you've learned at least a couple of things that you didn't know about before. And if you did, please give this video a thumbs up. It helps get this video to other passionate drone lovers like yourself. We're working on a lot of Mavic 3 Pro content as we love flying this drone. But let us know in the comments if there's anything specific you'd like us to dive into. Don't forget to check out our free LUTs in the description and we'll see you in the next one. Happy flying.